who is Jesus? We probably have some words we would put to that. And then we kind of have to explain those words and how they connect to us. Uh, in the Gospels, getting to the right word for Jesus is important, but even more important is getting to the right understanding of those words that are used to, to describe him. Um, I, I want to look at that in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38 from the New Revised Standard Version. And this is, event is found in slightly different ways in each of the first three Gospels. But I, Mark's a little shorter, a little different, and I want us to read through that today. It, Mark tells it like this. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with the disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, this becomes a major moment in all of the first three Gospels. There are several big things going on here. But in Mark, it starts just with Jesus kind of feeling the disciples out on this issue of just along the way of their journey. He knows they hear a lot of talk because that's what people do. They talk. And they have a lot to say about Jesus, trying to line him up in their understanding with all they know of their faith looking toward the past. So the people look to the prophets from way back or the recently deceased John the Baptist for something a little closer in time. And so they look at Jesus and they're just trying in their mind to make connections. But having covered what the disciples have heard, Jesus wants to know what they think, what they themselves have to say. Peter jumps past all this conjecture and then attempts to match Jesus that, or those attempts to match Jesus to the names of the people that they knew. He jumps to the anointed, the Hebrew, in Hebrew, the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. It's interesting that Jesus here in Mark immediately tells him not to say that to anyone. It's kind of a weird moment with this command for secrecy. And there are more words in all of this in the other Gospels, but in Mark, the oldest Gospel, it's really kind of brief. So why the secrecy? Well, the first lesson I learned in speech class all those years ago in college is just the simple phrase, words don't have meanings, people do. And it was pretty straightforward, this lesson. If you want to communicate with someone, you have to know what they think a word means, not just what you think it means. So... Uh, as far as the word Messiah goes, assuming you're a Princess Bride fan, I keep remembering the words of Inigo Montoya. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And hence, or here, that's why the lessons have to begin. Jesus starts teaching them right after they establish that this word applies to, to, to him, even though they're not supposed to tell anyone. He starts teaching them about suffering, betrayal, death, and resurrection. All of that is in the context of the word that they have brought into this, Messiah. And here's what that means according to Jesus. The problem is it's not what they think it means at all. And I like how Mark says that Jesus said all of this quite openly. Uh, in other words, Messiah might be a secret, but preparing them to understand what that word really means, not so much. It's all laid out. The Greek word, one of the things it can mean at its base is bluntly. 
you know, Jesus, he didn't hint, he didn't shade this, he laid it all out for them. So, of course, Peter, hearing this teaching from Jesus that would indicate that the word he first used doesn't mean what he think it means, he himself tries to take some corrective action. He wants to teach the teacher to define the word in his way, and it really backfires on him. But, you know, I've kind of always liked myself the interpretation that when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, he wasn't really totally talking to Peter. He was addressing the fact that this temptation to avoid the path of suffering was very real to him. It would mean that he had already considered what Peter was putting forth, and, and it was still in his mind, too. It really lines up with the way he was tempted in the wilderness in the other Gospels. He understood their understanding of Messiah, and for him, their understanding was a very real temptation. The words that he said to all the disciples matter even more here. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Well, yeah, uh, they are humans, so their perspective would tend to be human. And I, I think the phrase that's key there is setting your mind on. What are we choosing to focus our thinking on as we move through life? What is defining how we understand what's going on in our lives? Messiah, the word Peter used, the anointed one of God, they wanted to be followers of that one, but they expected that what that word meant was power, victory, triumph, and stuff like that. Jesus keeps talking sacrifice. Disciples, though, here's the problem. They are supposed to walk in the footsteps of their rabbi. They are to do what he does and to be what he is like. So if Messiah means suffering, betrayal, and death, in other words, the way of sacrifice, what does it mean for disciples to walk in his footsteps? So Jesus addresses that. And he calls even the crowd to join with the disciples at this point to get in on this lecture. But he insists that to follow him, to walk in his footsteps as a disciple, means that you need to deny yourself and take up your cross. And, okay, this was a bit unsettling. Being the Messiah is rough, and apparently now following the Messiah is going to be rough also. Jesus expected them and us to have to think about this. Denial of self is kind of a risky phrase. Some people, you know, already don't have a lot in their lives or, or have been denied a lot in this life already. And some people would like to get others to do some self-denial in a way that would benefit them. And none of that is the point of this. In no way should this, like, enable victimization of others or lead people who are already kind of pressed down in their lives to feel like, they need to have a low opinion of themselves and have no hope for a better future. It's not supposed to mean anything like that at all. It still all has to be in the context of Messiah and follower of the Messiah. And putting Jesus and the good news of Jesus first in life is what Jesus is concerned with. That's the place where the sacrifice comes in and the perspective of life has to, has to change. Jesus even explains how you know that your perspective isn't right. If you are ashamed of him and his words, that's the sign that you don't have your mind set on the right priorities. You can at times be ashamed of other Christians. Maybe you could at times even be ashamed of churches, but we should never be ashamed of Jesus, and we should never be ashamed of the truth of his good news of God's grace. So remember, words don't have meanings people do. They were wrestling with the word Messiah. Well, what words do we use for Jesus? Lord or Savior, maybe Christ. What do those words mean to us when we use them? Are we using them from a human mindset, which unfortunately sometimes tends to focus on what they mean for us? Or do we focus on them from a heavenly mindset and understand what they might require from us? If Messiah correctly understood means the one who gives himself up for others, lays down everything in the path of servanthood and sacrifice for the mission of God's grace, and then finds the final victory is given by the Father only after losing everything, 
then what might it mean for those disciples who follow in his footsteps? At the very least, it means that we don't see our faith solely in terms of what it gets us. We see it as something that teaches us to see life as being defined by the character, the person, and the mission of our teacher example, our servant leader, our suffering sacrifice, our Jesus. Jesus said they had their mind set on human things. Well, yep, we're humans. We're going to lean toward that priority set. But his teaching, his example, his sacrifice, and his spirit presence all work to shape us with another mindset, that of God. For the disciples, understand, this was not just one lesson with Jesus. This was a multiple-year journey with him, and it still is. If we are willing to walk in his steps and let our mind lean continually toward the things that matter to him, denying, because denying ourselves isn't that simple. It, it's really its own journey. I, I was looking at it and thinking you could maybe translate it as instead of deny yourself, what about disown selfishness? Finding Jesus takes place in an instant, but fully understanding in our lives what it means to disown selfishness, that, that finding meaning for that in our lives is not going to take place necessarily in an instant. And, and I'm not sure taking up our cross, I'm not sure we're going to understand that fully in an instant either. But in the end, we do know one thing. Wherever we are in that journey, we are never ashamed of Jesus, and we are never ashamed of his words. Even when we ourselves are still working to realize them fully in our lives, we are never ashamed to admit that we know him, and we believe that what he has to say to our lives matters and makes all the difference. Can we pray together? God, help us to learn what it means as we are humbled by your love, amazed by your grace. Let us learn what it means to disown selfishness in our lives. And it, it's, it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a continual learning process and learning to see more things in more different ways all through our lives. But if, if, if we really want to live in your grace and make it our home, the place where we live out of, it's going to make the difference. We will get there. We will learn and we will grow. And we will learn to see things not so much from the human perspective, but, God, from your perspective, with your eyes, with your heart, with your compassion, with your love. God, help us to just live that journey of disowning selfishness that we might ever more become like Jesus and be disciples who walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. I want to end with a few verses from Psalm 19 from the New Revised Standard Version. Verses 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12, and then make that our blessing for this week. The psalmist writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Clear me from hidden faults and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, to make that our blessing for this week. May you discover completely the wonder of how God's word connects fully and joyfully to your life. May you find that in living the love of Christ through that word, there is tremendous blessing. And finally, as you seek God's truth in your life, may you find the problems that only you know about fading away and the stuff that everyone sees and even the thoughts that define your innermost thought or self becoming ever more like Jesus.